Now I'm going to introduce to you the director of the park, Jensen Bissell. And Jensen is here to have a conversation with us about the park, and um, we'll have the chance to ask him questions after he's had the floor for a little bit. And Jensen, it's a pleasure. Barbara misspoke about the questions part. I, in my job, get to talk a lot to people about the park. But if there ever was a chance to preach to the choir, this is probably it. So I have a few points to make to you about the current management of the park and some of the challenges we face. But before I do that, I do want to take a, a moment. Um, I know that many people collaborated in this event today, but I also suspect from some years of experience that uh, Barb Bentley has done a great deal of work to set this all up and make it go for a long period of time. So showing her that appreciation. I'd really like to say it's great to see so many members of the Baxter family. Um, I've given, gotten a lot from these, these folks over a long period of time about the culture and the history of the Baxter family. Um, Rupert has taken me canoeing twice, tried to kill me both times, <laughs> almost did the second time. So I, I really feel like maybe I've come through the fire for that and, and made it here. It must be me to be here. Um, there's a phrase that's come to my mind in working for the park for 25 years that keeps coming up again and again. Um, a couple of months ago, I was on my way to the scientific forest management area. There's a point in that route where you cross a place called Chamberlain Bridge. It separates Round Pond and Telos Pond from Chamberlain Pond, and you can look back to the southeast and see a grand panorama of the landscape of the park. You can see the Katad Nungaho and North Traveler, and you can see a bit of the tableland. And, Every time I see that, the phrase jumps into my mind that one person owned all that and gave it all away. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was on the top of uh, Mount Co, and I'm looking down at the Klondike and across at the Tableland and a bit of the knife edge, and I can see the cliffs of, uh, and the ledges off of Harvey Ridge in the Northwest Basin. One person owned all this and gave it all away. And yesterday, I was on Katahdin on the Tableland with the breeze blowing in my face, and I'm really glad that the weather we had in that morning isn't the weather we have right now. But it's still the same feeling. One man owned all this and gave it all away. And he didn't just give it away. He gave it away in a structure and a purpose that I've just not run into something that equals it. It's not just the land and the patience and the commitment and the perseverance that it took to acquire that over 31 years. It's the financial independence the park uh, enjoys that makes it so unique and so successful. And it's the authority as a governing structure over time that he put together. It's just a unique and very far-sighted thing. And the governor was thinking about this at the time when the idea of wilderness was just growing in this country. And so he was a visionary ahead of his time all the way. So I asked myself to talk tonight about, well, it's been 50 years since that, that final gift. And you know what, what really has changed here? How have we done? And if you get up to a landscape view and look down on the park, you can, you can ask yourself the question, well, has it changed? And from a human standpoint, if you look at the human elements in the park, the roads, some little changes, but basically the same as they were in the early 60s. Uh, the campgrounds, there were there are 10 campgrounds in the park now. There were seven at the time, but Kidney Pond and Daisy Pond were operated as uh, independent contracts under lease, and the park eventually subsumed those. So those were in place in 1960. Crawford Farm as a campground was not in place, but it was a lumbering camp, and it had been a lumbering camp, and the park took it over and made it a campground. So if you look from the bird's eye view, from the Google view, the park, from a human standpoint, looks very similar. The trail system we have now, although there have been changes, the core of it remains the same as it was. Same place, same trails, and hundreds of thousands of people have enjoyed those trails over that period of time. If you look at the natural landscape, though, the landscape that we are charged with allowing nature to, to change without fetter, without being fetter, without being uh, interfered with in any way by our actions, the natural landscape has undergone probably a great deal of change. A lot of this is the way we would think of the hands of a clock. You can't see it happening, but if you leave and come back, something definitely is in play. If you look at the forests of the park that the governor purchased, which were cut over and burned over and had recently been logged, and I'm sure in 1960 you would have seen this in the park very clearly, if you go to the park today, you won't see that. And the uneducated and untrained eye won't notice that there was any harvesting in the park. The governor had the vision to see ahead of that. And those natural changes have happened and will continue to happen in the park. I would argue that 50 years from now, 
People will say that one of the endearing and defining characteristics of the park will be the way the forests look, because I think they will stand out from the forests of the state of Maine starkly in comparison, and they will be just what the governor wanted and just used to be. Um, and I think those changes are happening. Many of them happen very slowly, and you can't see them, but some of those changes, they happen very quickly overnight. Uh, landslides, wind throw, uh, forest fires, insect, insect epidemics happen very quickly and can change our landscape uh, very strongly. And they can happen overnight, they have happened overnight, and they will again. And we'll be ready to embrace that natural change. Those big changes, the ones that happen overnight, they always give us a lot of consternation. We don't like that. As a species, we generally really don't like big change, especially if it's not our idea. But we don't like big change, and we don't care if it's a change in health care or if it's a change in the store down the block. If it happens very quickly and it's a big change, we tend to uh, reject that. It gives us angst. It makes us uncomfortable. The challenge for the park is not in the big change, it's in the little change. Because we as a species, we love little change. If it's our idea, it's a great idea. And there are little changes we do, and that's kind of how we work. We're tinkerers. We like to improve things in whatever scenario we're in. Pretty soon we have an idea how we can make it better. It's really no different for us at the park, and it's something we have to constantly guard against. The changes in the park will come from us, not all at once, but in a thousand good ideas over many decades. And if we're not careful with that, and this is the hard thing as a manager to work with, if you're not careful with that, you'll look around and look back in 20 years and think, how did that happen? What did we do? So I find myself in the place of often saying no to what seem to be really good, well-intentioned ideas of folks. But they're small ideas, and if they happen long enough, they'll make big changes. The big natural changes in the park, let them happen. I hope we have the courage to accept them when they do happen and realize that the park will endure as a whole. This idea of wilderness, and this is the other thing I'd leave you with tonight, this idea of wilderness that the governor so clearly saw so long ago this is a human idea. This is unique to us to think of this. It's the def definition of the nature and human nature. It's not only a unique human idea, but it's an idea of our time. The idea of wilderness is not a an idea that was held in times before. So we have to ask ourselves, if it's a reflection of our culture and our ethos, will it still be reflected 50 years from now? Will our culture change so that the idea of wilderness becomes less important or unimportant or not important at all? We need to guard that because the color of that wilderness idea is what colors the clear gem of the park. And that color could change over time and as a group, people that really understand what wilderness need, means and how important it is to have wilderness even if you cannot visit it. That's an important concept, one unique to us and we need to do everything we can to make sure it's continued in the years ahead. But it really has been a pleasure to serve the park in this way, to serve this very beautiful thing that uh, Percival Baxter created. The last thing I'll leave you with is, I know this is Governor Baxter Day, and I think that when someone achieves the highest uh, office in our land, or at least our, our, our state, that we should always afford that person the honor and the respect of that title. But I can tell you that I don't think of the governor that way. I think of him as personal. I think of him as a man, a citizen. He did this work after he left the legislature. He did it on his own when he had nothing to lose or gain politically but because he thought it was right. He did it as a person, and that's how I've come to think of him over the last few years. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Those of you who were at the, who were at the sundial this morning um, heard Herb Adams make that same statement, that it was as a private citizen when he had that he had to give up politics because of the stand he was taking. He was so opposed, and that he followed an example that his father had set to um, by losing his political position by doing that.